So for those of you just joining us, uh, earlier this year we looked up, had a series on uh, fearing God, which is the key to getting all his blessings. And then uh, today hopefully we'll finish up a four-part series, I think it's four-part, maybe five, on loving a fearsome God. Um, if you have a good view of God, you understand who he is. He's actually scary. He's awesome. Uh, King James says terrible. <laughs> um, you know, and as the centuries have progressed, <laughs> the meanings of words have changed. But if you look at the scriptures, every time someone's in the presence of God, they're basically falling on their face, quaking, because he is fearsome. So how do you have a, a, this loving sheep-shepherd relationship um, with him? Um, our views of love in our culture are kind of uh, askew compared to the scriptures, where we just think it's a you know feeling a certain way about someone. Um, and there is a component of feeling very positively towards God, um, but there's a difference between sheep and shepherds. And, you know, it's like God's our shepherd, we're his sheep. We're, we're not going to have the same kind of relationship that we'd have with a peer. So first, uh, Roman number one from weeks ago <clears throat> is knowing the person and character of God, um, knowing basically who he is, and his past, present, and future acts or promises leads us to fear, trust, and love him. So that's you got to know God in order to be able to fear him. And then also, if he's fearsome, you can also trust him because he's going to take care of you. And then you realize uh, what he's done for you. You want to respond with uh, doing what he would like. So this you know, mutual service that goes on between us and God. Of course, he serves us a whole lot more than we serve him. And, and I really don't think people get the concept of what service is. Um, and I've used before the illustration of a you know, person in a restaurant who's your server. Um, I, I would rather have a server who is slow but is sure to get what I ask for than someone who's really fast and gives me what I don't want. <laughs> so you got to spend time waiting on God to figure out his will, his counsel, what he wants, and then you have to set apart yourself from what you want to do to do what he wants to do. And that's kind of what love is all about. Uh, now, one of the problems we have is that sometimes we don't like what God's doing. Uh, we don't think he loves us because he's not giving us what we want. So Roman numeral two, we address that. God is infinitely good and sovereign. That means anything he does is good and he can do anything. So all his dealings with us, logically follow, are for our good. And then we can embrace that and look for the good even in the midst of trials. Um, and if we fail to do that, we open up ourselves to Satan's lie that God's not good. And we all know where that, you know, just read Genesis 3 in the mess we're in today. And you'll understand that point. Okay, then we move to how to love God, and here we are. Oops, go back one, sorry. Um, the stuff in the blue ink or green ink or whatever color that is, teal, I, I, I don't know, I'm not, cyan, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, you know, th there's some stuff that's listed there, you can read it. Um, now, it's declaring his praise, um, we, we kind of do that in our praise time, and when, you know, You've all probably run into someone who's met what they think is the one. <laughs> and uh, if they're your coworker, you're subjected to, you know, <laughs> much more than you want to be or how wonderful they are. Right? Well, we should be that way about our guy because he daily loads us with benefits. His compassions are new every morning. Uh, so we should have lots to praise him about. Uh, the biggie is obeying. Uh, obedience. That was a big Old Testament thing, and we spent some time in that. And both obedience and fear of God are huge in the New Testament, and most people miss this because they only listen to evangelistic teaching um, as opposed to edification teaching. Uh, offer sacrifices to him, which means you take what you know you would normally have, like your time, and you give it to him. You take your desires, you give them to him. Uh, you, you replace his desires with, I mean, your desires with his desires. Then there's this really cool term, chesed, uh, covenantal loyalty, being faithful. Uh, that's how God always discloses himself. It's a great characteristic. Uh, you can give them stuff spend, and spend time listening, talking, serving. We talked about that before. So we looked at the bogus uh, world love, which some people carry over into Christianity. They never sanctify their value of what love is all about. And uh, they kind of need to do that in order to have a proper relationship with God. Looking at his love helps us understand how we should love him back. <clears throat> and love is a decision. We talked about that. It's a commitment to self-sacrificially do what's in another's best interest, regardless of the response. So John 3.16 is the spot where I first 
saw this, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish and have eternal life. But not everybody responds, yet God still loves. And it, then you take that thought through the scriptures and you see how God wanted what was best for Israel, even when he was disciplining them, but uh, they didn't respond, but he still kept up loving them and doing what was in their best interest. You see that in Jesus, particularly as he's interacting with the Pharisees, um, doing the same thing. So we started moving into biblical love, loyalty, hesed. Uh, we talked a lot about that, so I'm not going to go um, back to that because there's a whole sermon on it. You can find on toothpaste.net. Um, when I ask people um, how to love God, one person insightfully responded, make daily choices to take the path which would help me be loyal to guard their ways. And uh, if you read the wisdom literature, this, this thing about do not set foot one inch onto the wrong path. That was one of the Proverbs, I think chapter two, three, early, early in the Proverbs. Uh, I listened to a bunch of them at a time. So uh, it's in the beginning. It says, there are chapter three, it's got it, guarding your ways. Um, and we've got other things, which we looked at before, so. Um, obedience. You can't have a relationship with God apart from total obedience to his will, which knows no room for indulging your desires. And our desires are in the area of worth and value, power, pleasure, um, possessions. We do that. Um, we seek to get it from something other than him, and we are basically being disloyal to him which means we're being disobedient. So again, there was a sermon on that. Uh, and something that helps me obey is to recognize God's commands are for his good, our good. Right? I command you for your good. All right. Um, number six on this line, uh, show that I trust him by paying attention to what his word says and by diligently pursuing his will, desire, and commands. So diligently pursuing his will, desire, and commands as opposed to our will. And we looked at the concept of obedience as just a checklist thing where uh, we just pick some things, we decide, oh, this is what I'm, my relationship with God will consist of. Check, 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 done it. Okay, now I can go do my thing. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. Because God wants us to live wholeheartedly, which is the major thing that people fail on. So last week we talked about volitionally valuing synthetic happiness and I mentioned the Harvard study where they gave uh, people in a class pictures and they found the ones they liked and then they took away uh, their top choice and uh, then they had to have, you know, pick another one. And then after they picked and they basically shifted their whole way of thinking so that what was their second or third choice actually became their top choice. And when offered the first choice, they say, no, I want the one I picked. So we do something with our mind when we basically realize, okay, this is what um, I need to be happy with. We can actually get happy with that. And that's in a totally secular realm. It also is a function of grace in the Christian realm. So uh, it's a whole couple sermons on happiness. Uh, we did a whole retreat on it, which talks about that. And if you choose to value what God values as your highest good, um, you will be happy. Uh, if you choose to value what God values as a thing that determines your actions and attitudes, uh, life will be better than it would be otherwise. First John 5, uh, we love God because we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So uh, you know, I frequently catch myself, uh, and now I do it but as a joke thing, or say, oh, I have to do this. You know, I have to be good. I have to do that. As opposed to, and I'll still say this, uh, but it is a joke. Um, because you know, normally the, yeah, I parody what uh, goes on in most people's brains on, uh, I, I gotta obey. Oh, it's so hard being a Christian. Oh, this is terrible. Um, but you know, when you kind of get things from God's perspective, you can recognize that, yeah, this is, uh, it's for my good and you embrace it. So you can basically say, like Paul says, bring it on. He doesn't actually use those words, but, um, he gladly embraces God's will. All right, and the problem with uh, the nation of Israel, uh, Jeremiah, as I mentioned last time, he's writing to try to prevent the people from going into captivity as a last-ditch effort. And uh, God says, obey, yet they did not obey nor incline their ear. They didn't want to listen to what God had to say because they had their agenda, and that's just fatal. And then they wind up going backward, not forward, 
and at the risk of being repetitive, um, there's a book written by Chuck Swindoll, uh, former president of Dallas Seminary, called Three Steps Forward, Two Steps Back, which described the Christian experience. And I remember being a student there when the book came out, and he wasn't president then. Um, and everybody was so excited about it. goes, yeah, that's what it's about. And then I, I took that into its first century context. If you're actually trying to follow Jesus as his disciple, uh, you know, he take, takes three steps forward, you take three steps forward. He takes three steps forward, you first you take one back. Oh, and then you take two forward. So every time you're falling further and further and further behind. And you don't have an intimate relationship with God if uh, that's the case. And then you basically kind of fellowship with all the people who are doing the same thing you're doing. And you think, oh, this is what it's about. Failing to recognize that Jesus is, you know, over the river, through the woods, and the other side of the mountain range. And you're, you're basically just degenerated into community rather than biblical Christianity. So that's all previous times. Uh, I sent the prophets. They didn't. Oh, yeah, I need to do this one. I, I love this verse. Um see why there's actually two verses that go together here that's why they're on the same screen together so in jeremiah 7 um, through jeremiah god says i sent to you all my servants the prophets so prophets serve god by saying what god wanted them to say yet the people did not obey god nor incline their ear but stiffened their neck so they didn't want to hear they had their agenda. Remember we, the whole Pharisee thing? They had their agenda. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. So they didn't want to hear what God had to say on the issue. They weren't open to that. And as a result, they got, totally got destroyed. They had to wind up eating their kids. It was kind of, you know, the, the, the captivity. If you just actually read what happens when God burns his own temple and destroys his people because they don't obey. Um, and then let's go from there directly to Acts 7.51. Um, I think it's Stephen, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Now, these are people whose sins are covered by the Day of Atonement, both Old Testament and New Testament audience. This is post-resurrection for the New Testament. Uh, Jesus had been resurrected. People had seen the day of Pentecost. It was clear that God was doing miracles in their midst like he had promised in the Old Testament. Um, yet, they're just like their fathers. That means the Holy Spirit was at work in the Old Testament saints trying to get them to obey God's word. And they, stiff-necked, stubborn. They weren't malleable. They weren't receptive. They weren't embracing wisdom from above, which was easily entreated. They basically had, how could they reject Jesus when they see him raise the dead? How could they reject him when they see him, you know, heal a guy right in front of them? Oh, he did it on the Sabbath. He must be bad. Right? And it's like, <laughs> he healed, he deliberately healed uh, Lazarus on the Sabbath. He waited a couple days for Two reasons. The Sadducees used to believe the spirit left the body after three days. But he, it was timed in the you know, God's thing to be there on the Sabbath so he would raise Lazarus from the dead on the Sabbath. And what was their response? You all know the story. They wanted to kill both Jesus and Lazarus. <laughs> so beware. If you ever get raised from the dead, chill. You Don't let too many people know because they'll try to kill you. So uh, I've been an observer of Christianity for over 40 years. Having not been raised in it, I kind of look at it really objectively. And uh, yeah, I, I, what I see in the scriptures and what I see in people's lives, they, they don't match. Um, the, the people who think they have the spirit of God um, are way away from where the word is. And those who are more in the word don't have the spirit of God. It's just like put them all in a washing machine and maybe you get something that would fit. But um, beware, we talked about uncircumcised in heart. That means you weren't sensitive to God. And you always want to cultivate a sensitivity to God. And that's kind of what should happen in your quiet time. It's not just getting through a chapter or getting through a daily truth base, which takes a lot of effort. But it's also listening to God, um, learning to hear his voice. Uh, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. And there's lots of stuff in, involved in your life that there isn't a direct command of scripture on. 
So you need to figure out, well, God counsels you with his eye upon you. That means you have to be looking to his eye. This, this whole concept of um, getting God to guide your steps is something that I think is severely lacking in Christianity because most people in Christianity do not have a quiet time. And those who do use a devotional that it's all pre-digested, pablum, which is a story, and it's not the scriptures. And after 30 years of having quiet times, they still don't know what the scriptures say because they aren't in the scriptures. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people who go through daily toothpaste and still don't get it because they, um, they're just trying to get through the thing. <laughs> it should correct it, but, you know, if they don't listen to the prophets, I don't know if they're going to listen anymore. Okay, so now I think I get to where I left off last time. All right, it's going to be a race to the finish here. So, um... I gave you this section out of Deuteronomy 29. So there's the blessing and cursing section. Um, Deuteronomy is a great book. Everybody, New Testament believers, should master it. Um, because it's a summary of the law and the nation of Israel that came out of Egypt and why they failed. And you can learn much from observing failures. So um, he actually has the people make a covenant, including their strangers that among them. So there's, he, this is the sociological dynamic. Christianity is a spiritual dynamic, but God also uses the sociological dynamic of a body. Um, and here it was a community. So that there not be any among you whose heart turns away from the Lord your God. So whenever you see someone whose actions have turned away, their heart has turned away. Their heart is closed. Their heart is insensitive, and it shows up by being stiff-necked. So remember those two verses from the previous screen. Uh, Acts 7 and Deuteron uh, Jeremiah 7, I think that's what those are, whatever they are. Um, it's, you know, the heart is key. That's where your values, your conscience, your decision making, all that other good stuff is thrown in there. And it needs to be focused on God. A wholehearted believer like Caleb is the kind of person that pleases God. And if your heart turns away, the thing that results is a root of bitterness. Wormwood is actually something that poisons people. And the New Testament says we're supposed to watch out that this doesn't happen among us in Hebrews. Um, and here, uh, you know, God was warning them against it. And the thing that, the way this shows up in a person's life is someone would hear the words of this curse, which was like a huge amount of curses. Um, and he blesses himself in his heart and says, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my heart. Now, folks, this is not just something that happens in the Old Testament. This is what happens in the New Testament. Oh, I belong to this denomination. I'm good. And most of us say, no, that's, that's stupid. That's, that's not right. Stupid is actually a biblical word. Um, <laughs> in the NIV. The evangelical community is the same thing. Oh, I went forward. You know, I trusted in Jesus. So now I can do whatever I want. And there's lots of bad, 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 bad teaching that is out there that says uh, that's the case. Oh, all you have to do is trust Jesus, and that's fine. So let's get more people trusting Jesus, and we just have the whole world trust Jesus, and everything will be fine. Um, now, that isn't exactly how it works. This word for dictates, and uh, this is the New King James, I think, is actually the word for being stubborn. So uh, it's basically, I, I'm fixed on what I want, uh, uh, and I'll do it, and I'll have peace, and they just are not receptive to what God wants. Now, let's look at God's response to these are his people. We're going to see a couple passages today where they're people God loves, who he's redeemed, whose sins he has forgiven, whom he has blessed, but who don't live happily ever after. And Moses warns the nation before they go into the promised land to actually get it the second time around. Yahweh will not spare him because God gets really ticked off when this happens. That's what it means, the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man. <laughs> and every curse that is written in this book, and there are a lot of them, would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. Uh, whatever that means, it means it's not good. And then he goes on to say, this is actually a means of God getting glorified. Because when people look at the land of Israel and see how it is totally trashed and burned, uh, in the ancient Near East, they knew that gods were the ones who were responsible for um, the victory of their people. So that's why there's a lot of warfare. Um, and God was actually 
one of these days I'm going to do a sermon on the dark side of the God of light. Uh, it was he who invented death, uh, Adam and Eve. Yeah, that was God. Um, get rid of the Philistines, you know, uh, Canaanites, uh, that's genocide. Yeah, that's, God wants that. He's kind of serious about holiness, and he uh, basically does not tolerate uh, those who uh, worship idols because he's very jealous. So he was expecting the other nations to look and see how the land was devastated and say, what does this great anger mean? But why is this? And they said, the answer is, they have forsaken the covenant of Yahweh, God of their fathers, which he made with them. They went and served other gods and worshiped them. And then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring on every curse that was written in this book. So this fulfilled prophecy is a way of glorifying God. The Lord uprooted them from their land just as he warned and promised in anger, in wrath, in great indignation, and cast them into another land as it is to this day. Then it ends with a verse that you frequently hear, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Um, this is sometimes phrased, the Lord works in mysterious ways, which really means I haven't a clue. <laughs> um, and there are some things that we're not going to know, although people default to this a whole lot. But they'll frequently phrase this, and then they miss the rest of the verse. So the things which are revealed belong to us and our children that we may do all the works of the law. So, yeah, there's some stuff we're not going to know. Like, how can God be outside of time? How can he know uh, the end from the beginning? Um, we can kind of guess at it, but he hasn't told us. That's probably one of the secret things. So rather than spend all our time worrying about, oh, how can God be sovereign and give us free will? Um, there are answers to this. The thing that God wants us to do is obey the stuff he revealed to us. He's the God of revelation. Uh, Judaism, Christianity, they're revelatory religions. They're based on the fact that God has revealed what he wants his people to do. So we can do them. Ta -da. And of course, you've seen how Satan has undermined the reliability of scriptures. And you just have to look at the evidence and it demands a verdict of, yes, this is the word of God. But most people don't look at it. They mouth things that Satan has fed into our culture. And uh, oh, what about all the contradictions in the Bible? Really? There are contradictions in the Bible? Could you show me some, please? Let's look at them. And uh, I don't think I've seen anyone that isn't really answerable. So uh, I'm still looking, but, you know, who knows? One might come up someday. We won't invalidate everything else, though. Okay, under how can we actually express our love to God? Um, oh, any questions on that? Sure. Up in heaven, or can be interpreted that way. Do you have any suggestions for just like practical ways to consume that information with not getting into like a paralyzing fear of God, where you're just like, don't act and then kind of isolate yourself from Him? Well, that would be foolish because He actually commands you to. <laughs> um, I encourage people to get into the Psalms. I, I, I should have a sheet somewhere, like I did the one, some rewarding verses to consider uh, when we first started preaching down in Chinatown. Uh, you know, I heard the people who had been trained by the missionaries that uh, were born overseas and came back. It used to cause me all kinds of grief. Um, forgive them, Father, they know what they're doing. But anyway, uh, is to basically, I listed out all the verses on loving God and all the verses on fearing God, and there are more in fearing God. But if you look at all the benefits that accrue, the first Psalm, uh, or Psalm, the Psalm I read this morning, uh, Psalm 145, you know, he gives all these benefits to those who fear him. Uh, the verses on this outline in Deuteronomy, where he says, uh, he, he basically keeps his covenant to those who fear him and obey his commands. I mean, he gives the blessings to those who fear him, so why would you not fear him? Um, and one of the things that God frequently sh says when he shows up is, fear not. <laughs> because he is kind of fearsome. But I want a fearsome God. And we go back to the you know, scary guard that you want a uh, guy from Seal team, teammate to guide you through the pyramids uh, when there are potential terrorists around. You want a scary guy to follow because he's bigger than the bad guys. So most people have a cosmic teddy bear as opposed to Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah Jaws, <laughs> who can really fight our battles. So it's to basically realize, you can go through the concept that you'd also use on God's justice, of we want a God who's just, um, even though we might 
uh, tremble a little bit at how that justice could affect us. But if you know somebody you know breaks into your house and steals a bunch of stuff and gets caught, and you, the judge says, "Oh, that's okay. Let them have it. You got more than they do," you'd say, "That's not just." <laughs> Oh, so you do want a just God, and you do want a God who's all powerful, and you do want a God who knows everything, and a God who's always going to do what's right. You know, that's a, you know, probably he, he's good. You have to buy his goodness first, which is why Satan sought to undermine his goodness, then he sought to undermine his truth and faithfulness, and just look at how Satan works. So m maybe one of these things I'll throw together, or anyone else is welcome to a bunch of verses on that kind of like some rewarding verses to consider to just see all the good benefits of that. Yeah, and I used the example last uh, time on uh, just like as a professor, you, you uh, basically use fear of failure to motivate the, ch the students to um, perform because having that information and the discipline that it takes to get that information is what they're going to need to succeed in life, which is ultimately blessing. But of course, most of them say, oh, it's so hard. Yeah, right. <laughs> buck up, buck up. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, how do we express our love from God? Uh, someone said, quality time, totally. Uh, they actually wrote this in chiastic form. I was impressed. Uh, take an interest in all his interests. Um, so it, it, you just think about it on a human plane. If, if there's someone uh, that you are interested in, you take an interest in what they're interested in. It's like, you know, relationships 101. Um, so it's also in the friendship stuff. Uh, friendship is about mutual interest. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis says we picture lovers face to face, but friends side to side because they're both involved in looking at the same thing together. So if you ask people, what is God interested in? What does he like? Um, they might be able to say glory, although when I ask people why they're created, they can't figure that out. But, uh, he, he, oh, he's interested in us? Yeah. So he's interested in me and I'm interested in me. So we'll get along just fine. <laughs> well, what about him? What does God want? How does God feel about what's going on? And he tells us in the scriptures, you know, um, sometimes pretty explicitly, but a lot's implicit. Just looking at his loyalty to Israel, even though they were you know, totally unworthy of his love, uh, is instructive. Uh, get to know him and understand his ways versus being focused on me and what I want and need and like. So that's kind of the middle of that. And then set aside my interest. So there's Yes, these are the outside elements, and then we got a couple inside elements that match up. So, you know, are we focused on him, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, or strength? Or are we focused on ourselves, loving me with all my heart, mind, soul, or strength? Um, if you want, you can love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I won't object. But <laughs> loving yourself with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. So those are uh, pretty good things. And you know, basically, you know, asking God, uh, not just what have you commanded, but what do you like? What do you want? What, what, you need to, to answer this one really appropriately in this little sidebar here. You need to understand why he's made you. Psalm 139 says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He knit you together for a purpose. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says he saved you to do good works. Wow. Okay. So God made me and saved me. He bought me. He owns me. How does he want to use me? It's kind of like someone uh, in charge of a uh, talent for an organization that basically finds, you know, an orphan that's about ready to be, you know, killed by a gang. You know, it saves them, rescues them, gives them a home, educates them, trains them, gets them all ready to be used. And uh, then they basically say, wow, I'm pretty wonderful now. I can go out and do whatever I want. And totally neglecting the fact that there was somebody that basically did all this stuff for them for a reason. God has basically saved us for his glory to use us. And we need to kind of tap into, just reflect on your own life. Well, look where you were before you knew Christ. Um, look at what he's done in your life since then. Look at how he's made you, how he's wired you, what experience he's given you. All that stuff that I talk about in Toil about being faithful with, that's all stuff we need to be faithful with. The experiences, the education, the talents, the interest, uh, resources, the whole, uh, whole wax. But I want to look at this verse. Jeremiah 9.24, uh, we shouldn't glory in our abilities and the wonderful thing that God has done for this, but in him who glories, glories in this, that he understands and knows me. Two different words. This word for know is one word for love. But to get, we use, I, I get God. 
I mean, do you get God? Do you understand what he's about? Do you understand what he's trying to do in the world? Why he has us on this planet? Why does he have earth? Most people cannot answer. Of course, if you heard me talk, you probably can. Uh, why there's an earth to begin with? Uh, the best answer people might come up with, oh, to demonstrate his love. Well, yeah, there's a whole lot more. Ephesians 3, 10 will answer, at least to give you a spot to go to start answering that. Um, but Jeremiah gave a little bit more about the things we're supposed to understand, that he is Yahweh. Whenever you see capital L-O-R-D, that's the way they translate it. Yahweh, uh, this is the name that God used to reveal himself to Abraham, the nation of Israel, their specific covenant-keeping God. Yahweh is a covenant-keeping God who exercises covenant-keeping. That's what Hesed is all about. All right. Now, this little word for exercise, he executes, he makes the loyalty of the covenant happen. He also exercises judgment, which is a word that can also be translated as justice. Um, I put... I mean, I knew modern translations of justice, and I was going to put it down as just justice, and I reflected on it. And judgment's really good because you have to have judgment before you can have justice. There has to be discernment and judging before you can reward good with good and evil for evil. So when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to judge us, and then he's going to execute justice. He's going to make everything right. He's going to vindicate his servants. He's going to punish the evildoers. Uh, most people don't get that. I think Luke 12 is a good passage on that. Um, and he's going to exercise righteousness in the earth. Not maybe in our lifetime, but it's sure coming, which is why we believe in a future kingdom in which God will be in the heavenly Jerusalem, reigning over the earth for a thousand years, and there will be righteousness in the land. And then as long as we're there, just continue what happens. That is possible because Satan is out of the way. People can look up and see the shining God, just like we can see the sun, and they'll live in peace for a thousand years. But when Satan gets out of the abyss, he can cause people to rebel, which is mind boggling to me. How could people who constantly see God every day during the millennial kingdom be duped into rebelling him, rebelling against him? And then I reflected on the fact that, well, the nation that came out of Egypt continually grumbled and rebelled against God, even though they saw manna fall from heaven every day. <laughs> they saw a cloud giving them shade by day and a pillar of fire keeping them warm by night. Every single day, they saw God totally trash Pharaoh in Egypt. They saw him destroy bunches of kings and enemies before they actually got up to Kadesh Barnea to go into the promised land. And they rebelled when God said go. They said no. And then God said, okay, take a hike until you all die. So, um, so God picks three things that we should definitely know and understand. So these are worth meditating on, looking at it from all different angles, and recognizing these are the things in which God delights. So I think the smart person would say, hmm, if God delights in those, and I delight in God, then I should delight in those things. So that's a word to the wise. Um, I'm building on the wholehearted thing. Wow, just in a psalm this week too. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And uh, that's, I remember when I was uh, my first year at seminary, I mentored Prof. Hendricks. Um, paraphrase this. It doesn't say uh, these things I dabble at. <laughs> One thing I do. And most people basically have a holy hobby. It's called Christianity. And they kind of do what part of Christianity they like. And then there are people kind of came with some bogus views of gifts. So oh, yeah, I only do the stuff that you really like to do and ignore everything else. Somebody else will do that. Um, well, this is one thing that every believer needs to do to seek after God. He'll be found when we seek him with our whole heart. Okay? He, he promises, I will be found by you when you seek me with all your heart. And David wanted to dwell in the house of the Lord, behold the beauty of the Lord, and inquire in his temple. So think about what these, these two phrases are. Think about what, what they must mean. To actually meditate on God's beauty, attractiveness, multifaceted attributes. And then there's this 
Q&A time. Remember I, I started the series on couch time with God? The secret of the Lord, that word for secret is the word for couch, is with those who fear him. So most people don't have any conversations with God. And I have you know, no voices here, folks, uh, no psychotic breaks, um, despite what most people believe. Uh, there's being able to ask God and then have him respond. And I actually heard some of the praise times where people kind of were looking for answers and God gives answers. He's a God who communicates through his word by his spirit. Uh, I like the value reflected in Psalm 16 here. Apart from God, I have no good thing. So that really needs to be, you know, everything has got to be with God. Oh, another one of my favorite verses. I have a lot of favorite verses. I get fond of these. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, end of the book, okay? And uh, this great free will verse. We're going to see some more free will verses coming up in a few minutes. Um, Moses says to the nation that uh, basically in the kids of those who came out of Egypt, they are about ready to go into the promised land through the Jordan River, second river parting in that they I've set before you life and death. Now, he's basically elaborating what life and death is. Life is blessing. Anybody want to guess what death is? Cursing. <laughs> All right. Life in the book of Deuteronomy, particularly according to the blessings, was to be the preeminent nation. Cursing, the word for curse is to diminish. They would be diminished. Instead of loaning to others, they would have to borrow. Instead of ruling over others, they'd be ruled over. So, I mean, you can learn so much just by studying the words in their context. Okay, so in, in light of the fact that you got these two choices, choose life. He doesn't make you do it. That both you and your descendants may live. And then as a result of that choice, you may love the Lord your God, obey his voice, cling to him, for he is your life, and you dwell happily ever after. So I'm going to talk about choice in, I think, the next screen. So it's a choice. Let me just pause here. Have you made the choice that you're going to follow God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, imperfectly at first, but then get better and better and better as time goes? Choose this day who you're going to serve if you haven't already done that, and then he'll give you grace to follow through. Um, before I get to that screen, uh, someone said, I flipped the question about how do we love God. Someone said, flipped it to put, how do we not love God? Um, when something is more attractive than interesting. Oh, really? <laughs> um, it's like, wow, for something to be more attractive and interesting than God, we have to have a real short-term focus and we kind of forget who he is. We have to be deceived. Um, remember Psalm 27, one thing, uh, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart, Psalm 37. And uh, my uh, reminder about this is Esau the idiot. Um, Esau did not value what God had in store for him. So he sold it for a bowl of lentil stew. Now, I happen to like lentil stew. Most people don't like lentils. <laughs> what do you think? He, he basically, as his birthright, as where he was, he would have had this great inheritance, but he didn't value it. He just wanted the immediate thing. And his descendants are not just in the Middle East. They are all over the world today. They sit in church pews regularly. They don't care about the future. They don't even know about the future. And when you start telling about the future, most of you experience this. Oh, I don't care about that. And then you realize, oh my, I'm dealing with a carnal Christian just like Esau. And... You do remember Esau wanted to repent, and God said, too late. Whoa, that's scary. Kadesh Barnea, 1 Corinthians 10, tells us to go look at Numbers 13 and 14. This is when the, basically the giants scared them. And they repented, and God said, uh-uh, too late. Somewhere in, oh, where is it, Ezekiel. Right near the spot where God says to Ezekiel, don't pray for these people. Even if Moses or Samuel prayed, I mean, entreated me, I wouldn't answer. Um, the people repent as they are starting to get judged. And God says, too late. Now, I do have had sermons, and I do, that God does often work this way, where it says, uh, God relents when we repent because there are dozens of cases of that in the scripture, and it's always good to assume that God's going to do that. But the contemporary cultures, we take God so much for granted that 
we basically say, oh, I'll repent at the end of my life, and then I'll be okay. Um, now is the day of salvation, God says, so um, do it early. Loving God doesn't come naturally. Yeah, that's like animals are people who do things that come naturally. We're supposed to be uh, spirit-infused beings who uh, do what is supernatural because we have the Spirit of God within us. Um, we don't love God because it isn't easy. Now, where did we ever hear it's supposed to be easy? Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. For my yoke is, and it's poorly translated easy, the word that's much more, and I'll do this when I get back to the Fruit of the Spirit series, is beneficial. Do you know what a yoke is for? It's for doing work. It's to harness your powers. And they don't make velvet-covered yokes, okay? <laughs> yeah, they, they don't. <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, it pulls, it hurts. You know, it's like you start having to develop a callus. It's work. Uh, I was noting as I went through the Psalms this week that, yeah, he's the shepherd who leads us behind spine still waters. But let's not forget, he also tries the righteous and all the battle metaphors. You know, what do you need a shield and a buckler for? something <laughs> the stuff that goes around your waist sports armor or something like that uh why do you need that uh why does he train your hands for war why does he teach you to shoot the bow because the christian life is a battle it's against you know spiritual forces in dark places it's also he's also it's not against flesh and blood but if you look at psalms the guy surely got his grief from other believers um well what <laughs> Oh, oh, I missed that one, right? Yeah, love is a battlefield. That's totally correct. I mean, and even if you just look at that in the pure secular sense, yeah, it's like, who lives happily ever after? It's like, particularly in our culture, it's like, it doesn't quite happen. Um, so it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. And it's designed to be hard so you'll depend on God. God is so much more interested in us depending on him than he is in anything we do. Um so, you know, ask uh, Joseph, uh, hey, Joseph, uh, how was it in Egypt? Well, before I got here, it was really bad. Okay. Uh, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how was it? Oh, that price was really hot, but God sustained us. So, Daniel, how was the lion's den? Oh, great, they delivered pizza. <laughs> veggie tail joke for those of you who know veggie tails. Um, you know, you just look at all the apostles. <laughs> Hey, apostle dudes, like, uh, how'd it go? You know, you were able to do miracles and all the other good stuff. And, oh, wow, you all got martyred, except for one. So, like, it's designed to be difficult. So, Jesus, how was your time on earth? Oh, dude, you would not believe. Hey, take a look at the Gospels. <laughs> it was tough. All right. Um, so, we don't want to, we'd rather do something that's fun. And, uh, wow, that's an emoji. Nice job, Bill. You actually got one. Um, and we usually get distracted. Um, but this is not the ultimate cause uh, of our problems. It's basically, we have not changed our values. We have not changed our minds. We have not renewed ourselves. We basically try to live the spiritual life as worldlings, and we will always fail if we do that. So when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired of failing, then you basically start looking for, okay, God, what do I really need to do? And go to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Hey, you need to start thinking biblically, acting biblically, be responsive and receptive to the Holy Spirit if you ever are going to get happily ever after. Okay, wow, we might make it. Number five, I think this is the last one you're outlined. We reconcile God's love, justice, discipline by knowing God and his ways, his plans, and then trusting in his word and revelation. Which basically, okay, God loves me, but sometimes my life is difficult. Um, I know that that's the way God works. Psalm 11, he tries the righteous. He puts them in a crucible and he turns up the heat and it can be really difficult. But his goal is our ultimate benefit, causing us to be refined and purified. So what do I do? Like Job, we trust in his word and revelation. Job was able to say, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know I'm going to stand on the earth in the last day. I know that he is going to vindicate me. So I can continue to love him because whatever comes into my life, he has orchestrated that together for my good. Um, you might have heard me say the world's your stage. You are the star on it. This is not to help you develop self-centeredness, not like anybody needs to develop more of that. But 
it's to kind of recognize that despite what's going on around you, there's God has purposes for you. And regardless of what everyone else does, you can be faithful to him, loyal to him, glorify him. And that glory might not come until you stand before the judgment seat. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And by the way, while you're there, here's a whole bunch of glory I want you to take in with you. So uh, remember, he, dis- he is glorified when he displays his glory. And when he, he gives out glory, he displays the fact that he's got oodles and oodles of it. Uh, that's a Greek word for lots. Okay. <laughs> First John 4, 8. He who does not love who basically acts in a self-centered manner, says 1 John 4, 8, doesn't know God, for God is love. God is light, he is love. There are a few words that actually define him as a person, a character, and he chose to have love at that. That means that's the essential part of his being. Um, However, remember Philippians 1? Your love needs to be bounded by wisdom and discernment. Uh, so you want to prove the things that are excellent. Um, oh boy, here's another tough one. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, striving against sin. Oh no, we're not supposed to strive against sin. We're supposed to let go and let God. I heard it on the radio. <laughs> Gee, yeah, I, I read in the Bible though, it says you're supposed to strive against sin. Not only does the author of Hebrews say it, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, he beats his body, makes it a slave, runs so as to win, all that other stuff. Uh, You've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. So yeah, you got to keep this in mind. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked. When he points out the flaws that you like to keep it in, don't don't worry about that, all right? He he loves you. He wants what's best for you. Uh, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he beats every son he receives. Wait, that word scourge, yeah, that's kind of what that means. It's like, ooh, that sounds painful. Yeah, why is he doing it? Just like a coach tries to train people so they can win, God wants us to succeed. He wants us to live the victorious Christian life. And uh, sometimes this is necessary. And, and sometimes, like you look at Job, what, what did Job do wrong? And all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with any wrong doing. I have had a number of people in the course of my life dispute that verse with me. And I know I'm you know, basically dealing with the dark side when that happens because they are you know, clearly say, oh, he had to sin. And uh, no, no, it says he was blameless and upright, pure God and shoot evil. Oh, no, he questioned God who was sin. Well, look what God said. Then all that he said, he didn't, didn't sin. Um, so if you endure chastening, oh, there's that endure word. Yeah, hoop, many remain under the difficult times. God deals you with son for what son? Is there whom my father does not chasten? Um, child abuse. Okay, we won't go there. So I think this ends it. Yes, it does. Should be the last one. I want you to remember that I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man or woman or child. What God has prepared for those that love him. You ain't seen nothing yet. Any pleasure any good stuff that you offer to God as a sacrifice will accrue interest and wait for you in heaven. This is what it means to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, according to Jesus' first sermon, chapter 5 of Matthew. Um, Anything that you basically forego, God can give it back to you with such, you know, compounded interest that goes on for eternity. Um, It would some people say, well, I don't really know exactly what God has in store. Well, d- don't overtax your little wing because Paul says you're never going to know exactly what. So we got a little foretaste of some of it. Um, my trust in God is that anything he has for me is better than anything I could have for myself. Think about that. He made you. He knows what would satisfy you beyond your wildest dreams. You can't even imagine, it has not even entered into your heart, how much God is going to bless you if you fear and love him. So in the words of that immortal scripture, you ain't saying nothing yet. I'll take any other questions.
Okay. So what was the question? What chapter was that? Uh, Jer Jer okay, Jeremiah 7.24 for the tape. Uh, if you, the heart turns away, does the root of bitterness kind of automatically come in? And I think that almost always will happen because let, let's let's think about what goes on when you do that. So why would your heart turn away from God? If God's the one who's got all the goodies and he wants to give you what's good and he promised to do it and his commands are not burdensome and they're for your best interest, why would your heart turn away? Well, that's because you don't get exactly what you want. So you stop looking to God as the source of all that you have and submitting yourself to him and his plan because he knows what's best for you. So um, when you your heart turns away, you are no longer looking at God, you're only looking to yourself. And then you start getting, in one sense, bitter towards God because he didn't give you what you want. Oh, God didn't do me this. I was trusting him and now look at me. And uh, you kind of all missed out on the time when you were trusting God. And now it's like, oh, I've got to make it for less time. I missed all these opportunities. And, and you start getting bitter towards God. Then you start looking to other people to give you what you want. And guess what? A, you know, as finite creatures, we have infinite needs that are never going to be met by another finite creature. So creatures will disappoint us. And then we will get bitter at them. Uh, you won't get that promotion you wanted. Work will get tough. You'll get bitter at God for you know doing that. You've also turned away from your source of living water, and you don't have His grace to do it. And then you don't want to totally renounce Christianity because like that's like, acceptable if you're in a Christian community. So you basically um, are there trying to be a Christian, and then you start complaining. Well, God, I I'm being a Christian, and you're not being you know the God who gives all the good things. So bitterness would tend to um, there's, there's two kinds of bitterness. One, one is the bitterness that's actually directed towards someone, um, and the other is the more literal a bitter root. So there it's linked with warm, wormwood, which was a, a bitter root. So it's like you're not going to enjoy life. So there's this not enjoying life part that comes out of that because the whole context of God and his covenantal dealings is he wants his people to enjoy life. So turning away from God, forgetting God, not keeping him in the picture uh, makes you think it all depends on yourself. And then you start having this tough life to live. And then because you have one foot in the world and one foot in Christianity, um, you're not going to be too successful in either. Um, you know, you're not wanting, you, you won't overtly lie, cheat and steal or murder to get what you want. <laughs> so it, it just becomes a, a poor life. So what has happened now in our culture, uh, in, in previous centuries, people just kind of used to you know, be backslidden and fall away. But now they get aggressive about blaming their church for their problems. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a new thing. And that's kind of tragic because uh, they'll just never find the happiness they seek because they moved away from the source of happiness. I think that's how that works. At least it sounds good. I didn't get enough jokes in there, but we'll, <laughs> I'll work on it. Any elaborations on that or thoughts on that or another question? All right, so let's remember we are supposed to love God. He is a great God. You're not going to find any fault with him. If you think there's a problem with him, you might want to check your thinking. And if you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, these blessings open up to you. And if you don't, just remember what happened to the people at Kadesh Barnea. Caleb was wholehearted. The rest of the nation wasn't. Caleb and Joshua made it into the land. The only two people who were above the age of 18 who made it in when they rebelled. The rest of them didn't. And there was this guy called Jesus who said, hey, the way to life is a narrow path. Not too many people are going to go on it. So don't follow the herd to slaughter. Follow the narrow path up the mountain. The view is a whole lot better up there. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're a God that we can totally trust. You're a God who loves us enough to give himself for us. You're a God who created us with purpose and design. A God who invested much in our lives. You're the God who keeps us alive despite thinking about us. And if you failed to do that, we would just cease to exist. You're the God who showed his love in sending Jesus to die for us. You're the God who showed his love by actually wanting to take up residence within us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for those who obey. You want an intimate 
friendship with us. Father, may we have grace to reciprocate. And that grace is something you also provide with your spirit giving us the power and desire to do your will. So, Father, we pray that you would banish Satan from clouding our thinking, our responses, and we would love you as you desire. Uh, we would love each other as you desire, and then we'd be equipped to love the world and those around us as you desire. Uh, we pray that in and through our lives you would be glorified. So we know that one day that will happen very obviously, but we pray that it happens now as we are still on this planet. We commit ourselves to this task for your glory and honor. In Christ's name, amen.